expediency, what, you know, what, what gets me something beneficial to me immediately right now, uh, it, seems, it seems fanatical to them. You know, it's one of the interesting things about, uh, about this. Uh, as, as before we get to the moral, uh, the, the moral principles here, so you notice the way Ayn Rand uh, uh, put, it, gets, put in a plug here for Ayn Rand, the stylist. You notice the way Ayn Rand generates the emotional power of, of this scene? The men in the room couldn't, they couldn't decide whether it was, his voice was too great a calm or too great an emotion. They thought it was calm, but the air molecules were vibrating. But, the, you know, to, to a voice that wasn't calm. But the best, the best point, I think, is, is notice Rook standing with one arm on the table when he has to do something with his right arm on the table. When, he's, when he does something, he has to do it with his left hand as if he's paralyzed. What's, what is that? Why, why, why can't Rook move his arm, his right arm off the table? Yeah. He's, this is such an emotional moment for him. He's, you know, he has to give up, he has to give up the, the erection of his baby. His, his, his baby's not going to come into the world because in being true to his baby, he's going to have to give, give it up. This is such an emotional moment to him. That Rook's holding himself up. Uh, at, at this point, so that he, he doesn't fall down, and, 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 and maybe holding himself back at the same time from wringing somebody's neck, you know, but this is such, he's trying to, he's trying to reason with them. Reason's his only weapon, you know, and, he's, and he's, he's trying to, I think he's trying to, he's holding himself up, and he's restraining the, the outpouring of emotion that would burst out of him, because this is so important, because he's got to reason with them, he's got to be, he's got to stay calm to reason with them. You see, those, those are the very subtle way Ayn Rand shows the emotional intensity uh, of Ryan. A lot of readers miss it. They think Rock Cole. They miss it because uh, Ayn Rand doesn't, doesn't name the emotions. She gives you the perceptual concretes that you would need to, uh, to draw your own conclusions regarding Rock's emotions. She, just the facts, man. Just the facts. And then the perceptive reader, the one who's paying attention, <laughs> You know, we'll, we'll draw the conclusion. Rourke's intensely emotional here, as, as any rational person would be under these circumstances. Now, but we're more focused on the, on the morals. How much time we got, Chuck? Uh, let's see, we got uh, about a half hour. Okay, let's do it. We got, we got time. In what sense is Rourke selfish? I mean, Ayn Rand's, Ayn Rand's raising, uh, I think she's raising a profound question of, of moral philosophy. Let me, let me, we pay for this, let me use it. <laughs> and one of the questions here is, I'll deliberately hyphenate the, the term. What does it mean to be self-ish? Now, you, everybody knows the distinction between the words denotation and its connotation, right? The denotation is what the word actually refers to in reality. The connotation is the, you know, the psychological associations we, we have with, with the word. Uh, now, was denotation is objective, connotation is subjective. Now, uh, I think one point here is that the denotative meaning of the term selfish can only be one thing. It's concerned with oneself. That's all it can mean. To be selfish is to be concerned with oneself. Well, is that good or bad? Well, historically, of course, the terms, uh, the connotation of it has always been, you know, you victimize others, you step all over other people, and it's sinful, it's bad, it's... I mean, my mom's favorite adjective, you know, when I was a kid, was she'd get angry at me and she'd say, you are selfish. And I don't think she meant it as a compliment. <laughs> uh, I'm, just, I'm just guessing, I think, but I, think I, I don't think she meant it as a compliment. And certainly when I read The Fountainhead at age 16 and she said to me, you're selfish, and I said, thank you, she didn't like that response. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, is it good or bad? I think you know, Ayn Rand's point is, well, clearly it's good. Uh, if, if, if you're concerned with yourself, then and only then can you benefit your life. If you're not concerned with yourself, you literally could not live beyond the next two or three minutes. I mean, why do you eat a nut nutritious meal? Because you want to be healthy. Why do you get a good night's sleep? They say, why do you want friends? Because it brings you know, great joy into your life. Why do you want a love relationship? Because it brings even greater joy into, into your life. Why do you want an education? Because it's going to benefit your life enormously, etc., etc. Uh, so, 
uh, being concerned with, with oneself is, is obviously good. You couldn't live uh, if you were not. So how did the term selfish become synonymous with evil, immoral, the uh, un unscrupulous uh, exploitation or victimization of others? And of course, Ayn Rand's answer is, this goes back to the religious tradition in, uh, in uh, Western morality. The Judeo-Christian view is that uh, uh, virtue resides first and foremost in selfless service to God, and then secondly in, in selfless service to others. But selfless service is, uh, and self-sacrifice is the uh, moral theme uh, of religion. And then it became secularized in the modern Western world following the German philosophers Kant, Hegel, Marx, and selfless service to the state or selfless service to society or the people uh, became a you know, secularized version. Of so we don't have a lot of time, so let me, let's, let me finish. Well, hold, hold, that, hold, hold that thought. Write it down. Uh, um, now notice something. If selfless service is the criterion of virtue, then what is the, the, what can we expect, on that premise, what can we expect of the person who rejects it, of the person who's committed to uh, a selfish course of action, namely to pursue his own happiness? Well, on, on, on that view, uh, the per if, if, if morality is defined within the virtue, is defined within the parameters of selfless service, then the person who rejects it places himself outside the parameters of morality, it makes himself amoral or immoral. You, you understand my point? Consequently, from those premises, rejecting the only morality the self-sacrifice code accepts, that person would necessarily, in his personal dealings with others, uh, be an exploiter, would be a victimizer, would be, would be a user and an abuser. And hence, from the, from the standpoint of the self-sacrifice ethics, the, the, the view that somebody who's selfish is necessarily outside the bounds of a proper moral code and consequently, socially, would have to be uh, an exploiter and a victimizer. victimizer. So, hence the, 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 you know, the, the genesis of, of, of that mistaken belief. But notice it pushes off, if you look at it in terms of the history of moral philosophy, it pushes off the scene the Aristotelian code. It makes possible basically Jesus or who? I mean, the Greek sophist, the Symmachus, Callicles, the, the users and the abusers. Uh, either you sacrifice uh, self to others or you sacrifice others to self. And overlooks the point, it's, the point gets pushed off the scene altogether, the Aristotelian point that you can pursue your values, your goals, and what will make you happy by means of honest effort, hard work, rational thinking, uh, that you, they, uh, not, only, not only doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, use any or abuse anybody, but in pursuing your own happiness that way you can have an enormously positive impact, as a secondary consequence, you will have an enormously positive influence on others. We have te good teachers here. You know, a good teacher finds it fulfilling. Make your living, sort of. Um, <laughs> and of course, if you do a good job, uh, take great pride in your work, you, you, you benefit from it. And of course, other people benefit enormously, your students, the people who love your students, etc. Maybe a clear example of that is somebody who loves medicine, because uh, you make money in medicine. But, uh, uh, you find a, but not, it's not just the money, you find it personally fulfilling. You, 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 you love the work, you bring health where previously there was sickness, you take great pride in it, and of course, other people benefit, your patients, the people who love your patients, etc. That whole Aristotelian code of rational egoism, of pursuing your own values and your own happiness by means of honest effort, hard work, rational thought, uh, etc. And then secondarily, the, as a secondary consequence of your fulfillment, other people benefit too, gets pushed off the scene. And basically you use others, you sacrifice others to, uh, to self or you, or you sacrifice yourself to others. Now, uh, so Rand's point then is uh, selfish simply means being concerned with oneself. And being concerned with oneself does not necessitate, in fact, it doesn't even include victimizing others. Uh, we'll see that when we get to Keating. But um, the next question becomes, well, if selfish is concerned with oneself, who or what is oneself? And here's where the fountainhead is revolutionary. I think what, what Ayn Rand dramatizes in the fountainhead is that yourself Fundamentally, obviously, we're, we're bodily, uh, we have bodily individuation from each other, but fundamentally, 
Yourself is the values that you choose. What do you consider valuable? What do you consider important? What, do you cons what is so important to you that it impels you to goal-directed action? What do you love? What fills your life with meaning, with purpose, with passion? And one thing I say for Rourke, what, what are your values? And, and, of course, and of course, underlying that, uh, the judgment and the mind the thinking that you use to choose those values, to form those values. This is the self, right? The fountainhead, you want the, one, you want the essence of the fountainhead, two words, values, judgment. That's what the fountainhead is. You choose your values by means of your own independent, rational judgment. That's what the fountainhead is about in two words. Values, judgment. That's yourself. That part of you which chooses values, that part of you which judges, that part of you which thinks, which thinks, that's the self. And so you want to know, you know, one of the things that makes Rourke so great is he's a genius, he's also a simple guy. It's not hard to figure out what he wants out of life. You know? He's not complicated in a certain way. What are Rourke's, which Rourke's highest values? Put this up here. You know, actually, you know what, I, I'm kind of nervous. I want to do it on, on the wall. What do you think? ARI has a budget they can, no? Okay, no, I'm said no. I, every time I have, you know, markers and, and a wall, I just get this overpowering urge. It's, it's just part of my Brooklyn upbringing, I think. <laughs> what, is, uh, what does Winan say to Tui? He said, if we were back in Hell's Kitchen, you know, I'd start this conversation by saying, listen, louse. <laughs> it's just, you know, but, is, but now we're not on a, what, a restrained you know, capitalist, an inhibited capitalist or something. Clearly, Rourke's leading value is, is a certain type of architecture, his type of building. As he puts it to Dominique, my work done my way. I'll put architecture down here for shorthand, but it's, it's my work done my way. And then there were the key people who Rourke loves. Dominique, obviously, was his wife. Uh, Gail Winant, who's, it's, it's, it's got to be considered a love relation, a non-romantic love relationship. Cameron, of course, was like a father figure to Rourke. But Cameron's gone through, Cameron's dead through most of the story, so we'll just put Dominique and, uh, and Winant. Uh, make a couple of, a couple of points here, uh, just as important asides. N notice Ayn Rand, the, the, notice the passion that Rourke has for architecture. And uh, you guys know the difference between having a job and having a career, right? And a job is something you, you do honestly to pay your bills. A career is uh, something you do honestly that, that pays your bills, but something you love. And you love it. And notice that Rourke, one, one of the things that struck me at age 16 when I read The Fountainhead for the first time is, you know, because the people I knew had jobs. The good news was they worked hard. The bad news was they hated it. <laughs> you know? But Rourke had a career. And it made me realize, wow, you know, you could, you could have a career. You could have something you love that you're passionate about. You could fill your life with the things you love. You could love your career. You could love your, 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 your romantic re partner, your, your, your friends. Everything you do could be something of value to you. Could be could be something you love. You could spend your whole day making love, you know, in, in one form or another. It's, this is, this is, you know, I mean, Rourke doesn't need an alarm clock. You know, it's 5 o'clock in the morning. He throws it off the covers, leaps out of bed. Ha! I got a whole day to build something. <laughs> you know, he's just, he's filled with passion about, it, about this. And that's one important point here. Uh, another thing about Rourke's values, I think Ayn Rand here is, in, in the Fountainhead, is also making an important commentary about family. Notice that Ayn Rand does not show us Rourke's biological family because your biological family may be people you value or not. Hopefully you can value them, but they may be low-life creeps. Sometimes they are. Uh, family is about values, not about blood. It's about the people you choose, not the people that you ha you're, you're born into. Hopefully the people you're born into are people you would choose, but that's not necessarily the case. Notice Rourke's family. Cameron, 